Good morning. Good morning. How is everybody today? I hope you're doing well. Uh, we've got a nice worship service in store for you. Uh, congratulations. You have all passed the day to daylight savings time test. Uh, you showed up here for worship on time, and so uh, uh, you all get an A for you get a gold star for the day. So good, good for you. Um, just a couple of announcements. Um, first of all, I want to thank the choir. Um, we had a wonderful concert uh, this uh, past Thursday with the group uh, from South Africa, 2911 International Exchange. And uh, the choir uh, was able to sing a couple of pieces uh, and then uh, let this group from South Africa go, and they were uh, extraordinary. Um, the concert has been captured um, on video, and uh, so thanks to Brett for uh, being able to put that up. And so if you go to the church YouTube channel, you can watch uh, uh, most of their performance, and uh, it really is a, it was a wonderful night. So thank you to the choir for providing the potluck dinner, and uh, um, and uh, it was a great, uh, great event. Um, just a couple of things uh, before we get started. I uh, want to thank Alan uh, Cottrell for being our uh, worship leader this morning. And again, thank the choir for being here this morning and leading us in song. Um, you'll see in the bulletin that there are two inserts. One is for uh, Easter giving and Easter flowers. Uh, if you want to uh, make a donation uh, in memory or in honor of somebody, or if you'd like to donate flowers for Easter <coughs> Uh, Sunday morning services, please uh, fill this out. Uh, you can put this and uh, uh, check or money uh, in the offering plate or bring it into the office uh, later in the week. Um, and then also uh, you'll see another flyer uh, talking about one great hour of sharing. This is an annual offering that our church uh, participates in. It is a uh, ecumenical offering. So there are a number of churches around the country um, that, that take part in one great hour of sharing. Uh, this year is the 75th anniversary. Uh, 75 years ago, as uh, Europe was recovering from World War II, uh, there was a radio broadcast in which they encouraged uh, churches and Christians from around the country to give uh, during the course of this one hour uh, to make contributions to help all the uh, wartime refugees. And uh, so this became kind of an annual tradition. And uh, the offering has grown over those 75 years. Um, so that now they help uh, refugees around the world as well as uh, natural, you know, those who are recovering from natural disasters um, and other uh, kind of terrible events in people's lives. Um, it is taken still by a, a number of different churches around the country, uh, including the United Church of Christ. Uh, and one of the nice things about the um, One Great Hour Sharing offering is that the money goes to help uh, uh, groups that are already kind of on the ground in those countries. Um, so these are, uh, when you think about giving, sometimes you worry about like how much is going into administrative costs and things like that. Uh, the nice thing about One Great Hour Sharing is that this money is really going to help the people uh, who are in need because uh, the people who are already working are already working there. They're getting paid through other agencies. And so the money from One Great Hour Sharing really goes to help the people who are uh, uh, eating different things. And you'll hear a story, there's a story uh, on the bulletin insert about a, a fellow in Honduras and how uh, one great hour of sharing uh, helped him uh, around the time of the pandemic and continues to have impact on the people in his community. Um, also, uh, you'll see uh, Wednesday evening Lenten services continue on. Um, every Wednesday during the season of Lent, we've been moving from church to church. Uh, at 6 o'clock, there's a soup and salad meal, followed by a 7 o'clock worship service. Uh, just this past week, we were at the Grand Avenue Methodist Church. Um, this coming week, we'll be at the uh, Lutheran Church here in town. Um, each of the services have been different uh, and, and very uh, meaningful. Uh, the food has been excellent, um, kind of soup and salad kind of dinner. And um, it's really kind of fun to meet other folks from the other churches in the community and uh, be a part of that ecumenical um, uh, series. So uh, please, if you haven't been to one already, you know, come, come this coming week. Um, there's no, you know, it's not a, an accumulative study or anything like that. Uh, it's just a worship service. Um, they're nice opportunities. And uh, we'll be hosting one in two weeks here at our church. So, uh, we were hoping when this whole thing got started that we would be up in the sanctuary by now. 
um, but that's not happening. So uh, we'll have our potluck in the preschool, or the old pork preschool room, <coughs> and then have our worship service in here. Um, uh, the worship services have been averaging about 50 people, uh, between 40 and 50 folks, uh, and again, it's a really nice uh, opportunity. Um, let's see. You'll also see a note about Palm Sunday. We're only a couple of weeks away from Palm Sunday and uh, cinnamon rolls, which is, you know, the highlight for me of Palm Sunday. Um, and uh, so that will be coming up. Uh, today, after worship, uh, there is a uh, Sankey um, egg decorating. Um, Terry McManus um, learned, uh, when she was living in Michigan, I believe, learned how to do this, uh, this decorative Easter egg um, um, practice. And uh, comes from Ukraine, and um, she's going to be teaching folks how to do it. Um, I'm sure that there's room if you are interested in participating, uh, would be welcome to uh, to take part in that. Um, are there any other announcements, things that need to come before us at this time? <coughs> well, then let's uh, continue our worship with our control. <coughs>
that you are able in body or in spirit for the call to worship. God's love is for all of creation.
requirements. Beautiful. Uh, let's uh, be in prayer together. Loving God, thank you. Thank you for this beautiful day, for the sun that shines, for the chill that still is in the air, and yet the signs of spring begin to sprout up around us. We thank you for all the elements of the worship service, the beautiful music, the prayers, the scripture passages, the fellowship of friends and neighbors. We thank you, God, that all these elements of worship work upon our hearts and our minds, our souls, that they begin to open us, that we might be fully present to your presence in our lives. Help us, God, to be your disciples this day and every day. Help us to be shaped and formed into the disciples that you've called us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, the uh, scripture passages today um, have within uh, both, both the Ephesians text and the John, there's, there's tension uh, within the text. Um, the, the, the Ephesians lesson from Paul, um, there's this sharp contrast between um, what the Ephesians were before they knew Jesus and what they are supposed to be now. And, um, and yet... Paul says that this is not the work of the Ephesians. This is not the work of like their personal choices that they've made. This is act of God. This is God's spirit at work in their lives. Um, and then in the John passage, we have this, um, this, this push and pull between um, how do we get to eternal life? How, how do we get there? Um, in, in one place, it seems to... Um, Signify that, you know, by somehow believing in Christ. And, and we're to understand in John's world, believing is not simply something that just does with, like, one's head. Like, I, I believe. Um, no, it's believing is something in which we are fully engaged in. Uh, uh, body, um, mind, heart, soul. Uh, that when, when you believe, you are, you are committed to this understanding and way of life. Um, so, on the one hand, it's, it's this belief, this commitment to Jesus, but on the other hand, there's also this sense that, you know, God is seeking to save. God came into the world in Jesus in order to save the world, not to condemn, not to divide between the saved and the unsaved, the, those who get to salvation and those who are damned, um, no, to, to save the whole world. So what do we do with these these tensions. Uh, sometimes the church has has chosen to kind of really put a heavy emphasis on this idea that uh, John three sixteen. You know, in John three sixteen, that is the the kind of the, the epitome of what it means uh, the gospel message that God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. And so the the idea is about this salvation. And John 3.16 seems to say that, you know, this belief in Jesus is the key. But then what, what do you make of the, the rest of the passage? What do you make of the, the verse before John 3.16? What's John 3.15 and John 3.17 that seems to speak about a God who loves, a God who <coughs> seeks to save? <clears throat> I have learned over the years, I, you know, my theology has grown and developed, um, and it was just a couple of years ago that my understanding, I found, had a label. I thought, you know, maybe I was the only one who felt this way, but uh, evidently not. I'm in a lot of good company. But I would consider myself a hopeful universalist. Does that make sense? A hopeful universalist, in that I hope for universal salvation. But in the Bible, there is a lot of stuff that talks about you know, that there's different places that you can go after after we, we cross uh, this, this world and go into the next. Um, there's a lot of differences, though. I mean, you know, John 3.16 seems to imply that if we believe in Jesus, then that's, the, that's the, our ticket to heaven. But then there are other episodes in which Jesus is speaking to his disciples and tells them, many will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, and I will not know them. Because they have not 
followed through with the kind of the ethical behavior, the way that they've treated their neighbors, the way that they've treated their brothers and sisters. They've treated them poorly. They've not reached out to them. They've not helped them. They've not assisted them. And so when they say, Lord, Lord, Jesus says, you know, I don't even know you. So there's, there's more to it than just being a member of a church or just making a, a, the, the assent, the, the agreeing with one of the creeds of the church. There's more to it than that. But you've also got this Ephesians passage that talks about it's not about our choices. It's about God's love for us in spite of what we do or do not do. So where, where, where do we go with all this? It's confusing. So I am a hopeful universalist in that I recognize that the Bible has a lot to say about heaven and hell. Uh, the, the Bible has a lot to say about um, you know, who, who gets there and how. But the Bible also has this strong current that says, and God seeks to save everyone. That God loved the world so much that he sent his only son, not to condemn the world, but that it might be saved. And, you know, the, the question I ask then, well, if that's what God seeks to do, if God seeks to save everyone, won't God succeed? If that's what God wants to do, won't God, in the end, won't that be what takes place? So that's why I'm a hopeful universalist. You know, it may be that in the end we get there and somebody chooses not. I mean, you know, there is this free will, this uh, uh, we have the ability to make choices, but at the end of the day, won't God win? Love wins. Won't love win in the end? A uh, part of this comes from my uh, I went to seminary at Andover Newton Theological Seminary. It's outside of Boston. Um, in the early part of the 1800s, um, it was just Andover Seminary. Um, and Andover Seminary supplied a lot of congregational ministers, pastors, teachers, and missionaries. And one of the things that happened in the early part of the uh, 19th century is that uh, the island of Hawaii was discovered by Western Christians. And the Congregational Church just happened to be a church that sent a lot of missionaries to Hawaii. Uh, they did a lot of good there, and they did a lot of bad there. But one of the things that happened to the missionaries is that they were posed with a very serious question. Because the missionaries came with this message about a God who is a God of love, a God who seeks their eternal salvation, um, but a God who requires them to believe in Jesus Christ in order to get to that salvation. And the Hawaiians had a problem with that because they said, what happens to my grandmother who died 10 years before the first missionary ever showed up on the island? Are you telling me that this God of love that you proclaim is somehow going to condemn my good grandmother to eternal torment because you guys didn't show up 10 years earlier. Is that what a loving God does? And the missionaries were seriously conflicted about that because they had this message, they had been taught this message about what is required. And so what they did was they went back to the seminary where they had been educated, Andover. And uh, what became known as Andover Theology came out, which was the idea that all of us have an opportunity to meet Christ, whether in this world or in the next. And that whether it's in this world or the next, we have an opportunity to choose, to make a decision for Christ or against. And so they went back to the Hawaiian Islands and they proclaimed this new message about a God who meets us where we are, whether in this world or in the next. Still maintaining that there's human free will 
to choose or not to choose. But again, there is a hope, a hope for universal salvation. Now, I tell you all this because this conflict within these texts. And I think too often the church has used the John 3.16 text as this, you know, as this hammer to come down on people to be converted. Um, and we all who are a part of a church, you know, we can tend to kind of pat ourselves on the back that we've gotten the, the message. We have the, the ticket. Uh, we are believers. And so therefore we get to go to heaven. But we also know that that's not really what it's all about. And so Paul presents a very important um, message that we need to kind of put on top of this other one. Paul's message is about not eternal salvation, but about life lived today. And that's why Paul talks about, uh, uh, you know, that you were dead before and now you are alive. He wants to draw this deep dichotomy between a life lived in faithfulness to God versus a life lived outside of that. Because Paul believes that we are transformed when we understand who God is. That God is a God of love and a God of grace and a God of forgiveness. And that knowing that changes the way that we live our lives right now. Knowing that God gives us forgiveness allows us to offer forgiveness to others. Knowing that God loves us just the way we are allows us to love others just the way they are. Because if God can love and accept me, God, if God can love and accept me, somebody else equally as flawed, <coughs> equally as filled with faults. That's the, the beauty of this message. It's not something that we have done to deserve this kind of love. It's something that is simply given to us because of who God is, not because of who we are. And there's an important, important thing about John's Gospel passage too. I, those of you who have worshipped on a Monday, Thursday evening, you know the, 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 the service, it's a remembrance of Jesus' Last Supper with his disciples. Um, and then after we celebrate that Last Supper communion meal together, um, we have a series of readings. And the readings tell the story of what took place right after that communion meal with Jesus in the upper room about how Judas will betray Jesus to the authorities, about how the other disciples will deny even knowing who Jesus is because they're afraid, and how finally all of his disciples will abandon him and desert him in his hour of need. And as the last candle uh, and and what, what happens is, as each of those readings is read, um, candles are extinguished slowly. And so the whole sanctuary grows, you know, darker and darker until there's just the one kind of candle lit in the center of the table. And the passage from John is read about how the light of God has come into the world but that the people love darkness because their deeds are evil. And then the last candle is extinguished and the sanctuary is in darkness. And then out of nothing, the candle is relit after darkness and quiet, the candle is relit. The candle is relit not because of something that we have done. The candle is not lit because we deserved to have our hope um, renewed. The candle is lit not because we're such good people we deserve. The candle is lit simply because God knows the worst that
that we are capable of. And God still loves us. And because God still loves us, it makes everything else possible. Because God still loves us, it makes it, it, it helps us be better people ourselves and treat our neighbors with love and respect. Because God still loves us, it helps us offer forgiveness and mercy and compassion to those who are in need. So we've got this balance of a God who's come into the world out of love, a God who's come into the world out of love and has found resistance and hate and violence, and yet a God who continues to reach out to us in spite of that. 2,000 years later, we're still trying to figure out, still trying to figure out how to best live our lives in light of that incredible gift. It's, a, it's why I am a hopeful universalist. I still have hope. Amen. Let's uh, share together um, our second hymn. It's number 605, As Moses Raised the Serpent Up.
share a portion of our resources through ministries of the church, like one great hour of sharing. But we know so many who are struggling simply to find the food that they need or the water that they need to survive. Folks who are going without shelter, struggling even to put clothes on their backs. Around the world, in Ukraine and the Gaza Strip, in places in Africa, your people are struggling and suffering. We pray, God, for your presence to be with them. We pray that you might strengthen us to be of service and of use. And closer to home, we know those who are grieving the loss of loved ones. We know folks who are struggling with new diagnoses, struggling to maintain the therapies and the treatment plans that even though they know it will be helpful, they're difficult to continue. We lift up Ben and his family. We lift up Sherry and her family. We rejoice with Roberta and her friend Elsa recovering and coming back home. We rejoice with Alan and Pat at the success of their granddaughter, Katya, going to state. We rejoice with the South African Coral Group 2911 International Exchange, and we give thanks for their presence with us and the joy that they continue to bring to the folks here in Wisconsin. But God, in the silence of our sanctuary, we open our hearts and our minds to you. We pour out our prayers. Hear us, God, as we pray in silence. Loving God, thank you for hearing us as we share our prayers. And hear us now as we unite our voices in lifting the prayer that Jesus has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins.
Thank you, God, for loving us to the very ends of the earth and back. Your willingness to say yes to coming in the flesh, to redeem our world through love, has led us to give of ourselves generously this day. Take these gifts and multiply them across this world that you love so extravagantly. Amen. Let's close our worship by singing the wondrous love is this.